Hey everyone, I'm Ari, here with Rachel, and we're your hosts for the Merry Writer Podcast. This week we're on episode 183, and we're asking, what are the different types of conflict? Before we dive into the topic, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening, so if you haven't already, and if you enjoy the show, please share it with friends and feel free to write a review. Hopefully a nice one. Okay, so let's first discuss conflict in general. When you write a story, conflict is the kind of literary device that creates challenge within the story arc. So it's the major dramatic structure within a story that kind of puts obstacles in your character's way. You should be doing that. You should be throwing things in the character's way to mess it up. And then it's like, will they achieve their goals? Will they solve the problem? That's the conflict. Okay. So without conflict, uh, most stories fall flat. You know, we've probably all had those times when you've read a story and you're like, what the hell? Where was the, where was the, the tension? Where was the conflict? It was just kind of doop de duping along. So conflict is kind of important. It's what makes the story compelling and you want to have readers really connecting to the characters. You want them to become invested in whether those characters will overcome the conflict. And obviously, you know, big conflict, small conflict. It's what makes life, I was going to say, it's what makes life interesting. But when you're in the middle of a conflict in real life, probably not when you're just stressing about things and obstacles. But, you know, in books, we want to see that. We want to see our characters struggle. So once you have conflict, you move the story forward by showing what that conflict does to the status quo, to the character, how were they responding to it, and how they may respond to it later, because obviously you do change, you know, characters learn and grow, and they will resolve or fail to resolve the conflict created, because it's not automatically, yay, they passed all the obstacles and everything was great. That can be useful, but it can also be a little boring at times. Okay, so hopefully with that messy explanation, you should have an idea of what the hell conflict is. So there are different types of conflict, and that's what we're going to discuss. Let's start with the first one. Pretty obvious. Character versus character. Probably the most well-known. This is where you have characters pitting against other characters. You know, you're a typical hero and villain. Oh, my God. It doesn't have to be uh, two opposing characters. It could also be like a group of characters. So it's not just like one hero and one villain fighting for supremacy it could be a group of characters fighting against a single evil villain or two groups of characters you know it doesn't have to be that it also doesn't have to be so dire as hero and villain it could be two lovers who are at a crossroads in their relationship you know if you write a romance or two siblings struggling to cope with a life-changing event and it creates a clash between them again that's I'm no drama. I don't know. So this is kind of a great conflict type, especially if you're a new writer, because you can delve into the different characters and the reasons and motivations for why the conflict has arisen, how they're going to deal with it, how it has rippling effects on themselves and other peoples. You know, I think most books kind of have a a character to character conflict. Big, small, it doesn't matter. Most of them have that. I also want to add that you can have more than one character versus character conflict within the same story. Because as Ari just explained, you could have two siblings struggling to cope with something. You could have two lovers struggling with something. You have the hero, the villain, the protagonist, the antagonist. You have all of these different people or, you know, whatever race your characters are. The main character of the story doesn't just go through one conflict with others at a time. There's almost always more drama than that. I mean, just think about real life. You almost never just go through one piece of drama at a time. And then when one gets resolved, something else comes along and you just go through the motions of that. Nine times out of 10, or at least for me, I don't know about any of you guys, everything has to happen all at once. When it rains, it pours. But the tricky thing with that is that you need to find a good balance with all of that. But I have seen stories and movies and stuff where, you know, you have the main character and then everything comes crashing down all at once. Their love interest is no longer talking to them. They're not getting along with their sibling. Their best friend had a fight with them and that now they're all alone and they're sad. It's overused, but you know what? It works. And nine times out of 10, that's what gets the character to get back up and start fixing things, whatever it may be. Yeah, you're right. Having those other things in, um, I'm going to throw in because I, I, I watched Lord of the Rings movie on the weekend because I couldn't find anything else to watch. I was like, I always go to Lord of the Rings. And I remember the bit where, again, movie where they get to, or spoilers, <laughs> where it's near the end of the movie 
and they're just about to be attacked by the Urukai. And then Boromir is also trying to take the ring. So you've got the, the group against the Urukai, this big fight scene coming up, but you've also got this little conflict of one of the team members being a bit of a dick and being overwhelmed by the power of the ring and trying to take it. You know, and then obviously you've got Frodo's in a conflict knowing he's gonna have to leave because it's not safe for him with any of them kind of feeling. So there's like three conflicts, but they're all of different sizes and they all come in at different ways. It's kind of like leafing over each other. So there's there's ways of doing it well and getting the balance and that. So yeah, that's my Yeah, because I was just gonna say that's one scene. Yeah, it is. All three of those conflicts are happening in a single scene. There's a lot going on. It's like it starts with Boromir trying to take the ring, then it leads into the Urukai attack, then it leads into Frodo leaving to be safe. So yeah, they kind of it's not like it's like, it's all ni- nicely flows together to give you this sense of excessive conflict. So that's really good. Okay, with that, let's move on to our second one, as I try to remember it. Next, we have character versus nature. Let's be honest, we've all seen those really awful natural disaster movies that we keep watching, even though we don't know why. You know, where there's a hero or a group of main characters and they're working against a natural force that they've got no control over, like a coming storm or a volcano or a shark. I'm only thinking that because The Meg 2 is out. And I did watch The Meg and it was awful, but I will probably go see The Meg 2 because... But uh, yeah, so, so, or it could be, you know, you're stranded on an island full of dinosaurs during a power cut and the electric fence goes down. So that's what it is. You've got character versus nature. And it's an interesting conflict to use because unlike character versus character, the opposing force does not have, usually, a evil driving intent or a misplaced sense of justice that you get from people characters. It just is. You know, the raging storm, the frigid avalanche, the devastating sea, they're not trying to kill you. I appreciate Moby Dick was probably trying to kill Ahab. <laughs> and the Meg did seem to go very specifically for those people and Jaws and everything. But most of the time... <laughs> These nature things are not driven to try in some kind of nasty way to go for you. They're just the way it is. You know, it's just how humans are meant to adapt and manage and survive. And the story flows that way. So, yeah, there you go. I don't read many books with that. It's usually movies I see. Obviously, I know that Jaws was a book and things like that. But yeah, it's usually you see it in movies. Well, I think one of the big things with character versus nature is that the character has no control over it. I mean, depending on what genre you're writing, maybe your character can very well trek up the volcano and pray to some god and will the volcano not to erupt. But nine times out of ten, the volcano is going to do what it's going to do and it's going to erupt anyway because it's a freaking volcano. Whereas like with character versus character... In a way, you can say that that's something that's out of their control as well, but it depends on how they react to it and how they discuss things with the other characters and things like that. I feel like a lot of times with character versus character, a big thing with the conflict is it's miscommunication, whereas character versus nature, it's like nature is an antagonist. It's just there to screw with the character, but it's not doing it on purpose. As Ari said, it's not evil, and it's just something the character has to deal with because they have no control over the cause. They just need to figure out how to deal with the effect. Perfectly said. I'm not going to add anything else to that. Which leads us on to the next one, which is character versus themselves. So this is your inner character that can drive a story from the challenge that comes from the main character themselves. Common conflicts within are fear of failure, where the character may refuse to act or even flee from the situation that they're supposed to be dealing with. So the arc has them finally overcoming that. They have to acknowledge the conflict, why they're doing this, and then kind of push through it. And that got guilt that requires them to finally forgive themselves. Struggle between desire and duty. When the character is torn between what they should do and what they want to do. Now, again, you could probably make a whole book where the character is dealing with inner conflict. I'm sure that would be good. Most of the time when I see that, it's an add-on to another one. Whether it's character versus character, character versus nature, you've got this kind of, usually in a backstory, this sort of wedge in some guilt or some shame that this character has. But there's loads of ways to do it. It's creating a vice, isn't it? It's creating a weakness or a fear that the character has to overcome. And it's a really good extra subplot to throw in. So yeah, we do love ourselves some character versus themselves, don't we? Man, I had a good point and it just left. Like I hit the unmute button and my brain was like, meh, we don't want to talk. 
I mean, to be honest, I really don't have too much to say about character versus themselves because I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with internal conflict because we all go through it every single day, just imposter syndrome alone. Yeah, so I don't have much to add to that because I can't remember what the hell I was going to say. So there you go, Ari, continue. If your point comes back in the middle of something else, just say it and I'll just yeah. I'll either edit it in or just leave it where it is. Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to character versus technology. So this is mostly for your sci-fi writers, where you have character that is pitted against technology, and this could be in the form of something the character made themselves, such as a robot. A good example of this would be the movie Megan. I'm going to use movies a lot because I'm watching a lot of movies at the moment. Or you could have one that is sent to kill the character, you know, like the Terminator. Or maybe you have a very destructive AI, such as Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Or even a whole system, like the Matrix. So, sorry about the movie references. I have been kind of on a kick with sci-fi recently. That's where it's all coming from. And if you want a book reference, 1984 by George Orwell is very character versus technology because obviously the the technology controls their lives and it's watching everybody, very big brother. And, you know, the character has to kind of deal with that in his life. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, it could be something as simple as some like caveman who ends up being teleported through to 1994 and trying to figure out how to use a cell phone. Do we have cell phones in 1994? <laughs> I said, I said self we don't even say that in it over here but yeah all right the television whatever so it doesn't have to be something like so in the future you know spaceships and everything it could be something as simple as caveman dealing with how to use technology like the movie with Brenda Frazier what was it called you know it was it was frozen it was a, a, a caveman frozen in the ice seriously people I am sure that's a movie I I have a memory in there I am sure it's called something so I'm just um, shaking my head at you right now I don't I'm I got no to, clue while while Rachel jumps on that and says some stuff I am going to go and check that that is a movie and I'm not just having a brain aneurysm <laughs> Brendan Fraser is great, though, just gotta say. Uh, but yeah, with the whole character versus technology thing, I mean, it can, here's the thing. I, I mean, I kind of mentioned this earlier with the character versus character thing, but you can mix and match the different conflicts because I feel like a good thing with character versus technology, it could be something that's like a massive power outage, for example, because that's the technology. But the more I think about it, in a way, that's kind of character versus nature. Unless the electricity just decided to crap out, then I guess it's just technology. If there's a power outage, from like a big storm or hurricane or something, then that would be character versus nature. But I think a lot of people can have fun with character versus technology, especially in the sci-fi and fantasy genres, because you can make up your own technology and just fiddle around with it and figure out what technology is good, what technology is bad, and how do your characters deal with it, especially if there's a piece of technology that's new. I mean, it's just kind of like a big thing for me is thinking of iRobot, where they had the robots and then they created a new type of robot. And then they were the ones that with the whole AI thing and they were the ones that tried taking over the world. But like the the other robots, they were just they were innocent. They were fine. And, you know, that's that one's complicated, but I like it. I like the movie. <laughs> I say I agree. Yeah, I I love iRobot. And yeah, you're right. I think there's even parts where, spoiler, where the old robots even protected him. So it's not like, oh my God, all technology is bad. Robots are bad. It was these specific robots because of this situation. Other robots were actually, you know, protecting and everything. And just because I found out it was called California Man with Brendan Fraser. Um, also original title was Encino Man. So if you sat there going, what the hell's California Man? And yes, he was a frozen person who then came out and was trying to get used to, I don't know, the 80s and 90s. I think it was the 90s. So yeah, I was not having a brain aneurysm. I did have a weird memory from way back when. And and there we go. And I've already forgotten what we're talking about. Technology. Totally nothing about that. But yeah, you're right. So it's and there's, and there's so much technology, isn't there? There's you know you have the AI, you have computer systems, you have virtual reality and robots, and you can go into space. You've got spaceships and space stations and and things like that. So there's so much you can do. And even technology in a form of like steampunk, it doesn't have to automatically be like heavy sci-fi. You could bring it into steampunk and things like that. So yeah, plenty to think about there. Do you have anything else to have? Okay. With that being said, let's move to our next one. I bet you're all getting bored. Now I'm going, how many has she got? I've got so many. All right, I've got two more. That's all. So next is character versus supernatural. This is pretty obvious, I'd like to think. So it can be anything from dealing with being trapped in a haunted house, attacked by a horde of zombies, stalked by vampires, chased by lycanthropes, or trying to figure out if your neighbour has been possessed by a demon. Lots to do. It can be in a fantasy world. It could be in a 
sci-fi, you know, zombies on space in space. You don't know. That would be quite creepy, actually. Zombies in space. Didn't think about that one. Or, you know, you've got the, the old classics of Dracula. You've got the modern stuff. Plenty to do. So with that, you've got the conflict that increases with having to deal with a situation that may add horror to kind of an ordinary life and deal with things outside the general scope of your character's understanding. So if they're, if they're characters who are not used to seeing vampires around or zombies or aliens or whatever, then it's kind of, oh my gosh. It's not the same as say throwing a character in a sci-fi movie to deal with aliens when they already know there's aliens around but it's kind of you know it might be a slightly different type of alien they're not used to but yeah so that's where it is it's so unknown for them that they have a completely different set of conflict with how they're supposed to interact react survive so yeah that's that's a good one and obviously there's whole genres dealing with shapeshifters and demons and, and aliens and things so i say that as someone who writes that stuff i don't even have much to add to that all because all i can think of is signs and war of the worlds original or remake of war of the war worlds of the world. mm-hmm. oh i have no idea did it have tom cruise in it yes then it was a remake oh okay <laughs> It's, there's so many I think like that's that. the only one I watched. Yeah. It, it I was, was thinking because, yeah, I watched it a long, long time ago. So I vaguely remember <laughs> it, but I, because I don't think I've watched both. I think I've only just seen the one. To be fair, I watched Invasion of the Body Snatchers with, with, give me a minute, Donald Sutherland. Wow. Donald know. Sutherland, when he was young. <laughs> and I didn't realize that that version was a remake. So I haven't even seen the original oh, of the, the Invasion of the Body Snatchers. By the way, if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. It's great. Just seriously, binging a lot of the classics <laughs> at the moment. And the non-classic, but just binging a lot of movies. This is what I should be doing. I should be writing. And instead, I'm watching sci-fi when I don't write sci-fi very often. So anyway. To be fair, I feel like it's easier to reference to movies when we talk about these things. Because if you mention a movie, I guarantee you most people have seen it. But everybody has such vast different tastes in books that if you try to reference to a book, I feel like people will be like, oh, I've heard of that, but I haven't read it, you know? And also you might end up dropping a spoiler on a book that, as you said, yes. People are much more upset if you get a spoiler about a book than a movie. Mm-hmm. And also, if you haven't watched some of these movies and they've been around forever, like if you don't know The Matrix, then it's not my fault if I spoil it for you. Because what are you doing? Go and watch the fucking Matrix, seriously. Or Terminator or any of these. I'm looking at you, Rachel, because I know some of these movies you probably haven't seen. <laughs> I've watched The Matrix. Have you seen The Terminator? No, but what? I have watched The Matrix and it went right over my head. Didn't understand any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send you a list of movies as like, you know, you have to watch uh, these. Oops, um, I'm banging okay. stuff. <laughs> this, is, this is a long <laughs> episode, so we're, we're almost there, people. Just hold on a bit longer. Last one. Although there's probably going to be people in the comments going, you missed something. Last one. Character versus society. So this is where a character pushes back against the injustice or tyrannical laws of the government, culture, blah, 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 whatever it is that's societal that is pushing and causing issues. Obviously, I have to go to the most obvious example that everyone knows, and that would be the Hunger Games, where throughout the story it's shown that the societal system is kind of wrong and damaging outside of Central, where like all the rich people who wear weird outfits are. And obviously, if we go back to the original one, which was 1984, that is also one that has character versus society, as well as character versus technology, because the whole system is wrong and needs to be fought against. And another example with the book, look at me, I'm trying to be better with books, would be the Red Queen series by Victoria Averard. I am probably butchering that. I apologise, Victoria. But yes, her series where you've got the red-blooded characters with no special abilities and they're treated very lowly as like cannon fodder almost and heavy workers compared to the silver blood people who have got all these special abilities and they use them to rule and kind of lord it over everybody. So that's another one where the, the societal structure needs to be fought against and brought down. The more I think about it, the more I've seen like that. Again, usually it's a, it's a thread through another one. So you might have character versus character and then a thread of this runs through. But yeah, there you go. I give you some book examples. I'm quite proud of myself. Honestly, I have Brendan Fraser on the brain. So I was thinking of Georgia the Jungle. Have you seen that movie? I love that movie. I have seen all movies. <laughs> that's but, not true. Yeah, that's but yes, true. I, I don't know why that. I'm asking you. But yeah, Georgia the Jungle was my go-to movie when I was a kid. And like, I always watched it whenever I got sick. I love that movie. I should watch that again. That's such a good movie. But the more you talked the more I realized that I actually have a book example as well. The Selection by Kiera Cass. Did you ever read those? They're, they're young adult. 
No, I haven't read them. They don't ring a bell. Yeah, it's a, it's a trilogy. And the selection is the first book. And it's basically the selection. It's kind of like The Bachelor in a way where they have like a bunch of bachelorettes live in the castle for X amount of time and they all compete for the prince's affection. So that way, and she'll be the new queen and all that fun stuff. But the way that the selection works is that everybody in society is in a cast. So like they're they're listed by numbers. So like one is basically the king and queen. They're obviously high up on the list. Whereas an eight, those are like the homeless people. And there's a lot of discrimination depending on what cast you're in. And you can only have certain jobs depending on what cast you're in. Like they make it so that you can pretty much only make a certain amount of money. And the big thing is that the protagonist, she's she's a five and she gets chosen to be in the selection. And it's, you know, and and she actually works really hard to abolish like the caste system and stuff like that. It's pretty good. But that, yeah, that's the main example I can think of for character versus society. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's like there's probably so many more that we don't always think of because it's, it might not be the overarching theme. And I think that's where we go to with all this. So I may have listed so many conflicts, but most stories have more than one and there might be the the strongest plot might be character versus character or character versus supernatural but then there might be threads of character versus themselves and character versus society and character versus technology so it's not kind of an either or you don't have to pick one and, and, and not have another it's just to give you an idea of extra threads you can put in or ideas for where a story can go you know you could be writing a really awesome story where it's character versus character or character versus technology and as you're writing you could be like wow i could actually thread in some society issues here to show that there's something deeper and like kind of add layers and and more flavor to your story so hopefully this very long episode has given you a bit more to think about with the types of conflicts rather than just going my story needs conflict you can kind of go a bit deeper in with it i don't know or maybe you're just like oh there's too much to think about i'm not listening to any of this also very possible um i have nothing else to add because i feel like i've just talked forever in this episode apologies for that rage anything rage there's nothing else either so let's just end this now Okay, let's turn it over to you guys. Which type of conflicts happen in your current whip? I would love to hear that. So put them in the comments below and we can have a quick chat about it. Remember, we release new episodes every Wednesday. Next week, we're joined by a guest as we discuss what health problems can writers face. To ensure you don't miss it, hit the subscribe button on your way out. And as always, thanks for listening to the Mary Rice Podcast. See you next week. This podcast is brought to you by Felt It Pens. We love to colour code. The music, titled Inspired, is by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0.